I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Ian Robertson, Director of Fire and Safety Specialist at Caledonian Fire Safety Solutions, who will be speaking on Scotland Fire Safety Management Guidance for Legal Duty Holders. Over to you, Ian. Hi, thank you everybody for attending today, and apologies for the slight technical delay. Um, apologies. So today we're going to be touching on fire safety management guidance for legal duty holders in Scotland, and hopefully you find it of some benefit. The topics we're going to be covering today, oh, sorry, I'm not going to take the late, shall be best practices on the selection of a competent fire risk assessor, the various types of fire risk assessments which have been designed specifically for domestic flats, and we'll look at the Scottish Fire and Record Services procedural response changes regarding unwanted fire alarm signals effective from July the 1st, 2023. So, we will pop the questions at the end of today's webinar. I'll feed them through to Julie and we'll pick up on them at the end of the webinar, please. First topic how to find a competent fire risk assessor. Let's look at some of the options we could consider. Chartered fire engineer, a 30 years' experience in Scottish Fire and Rescue Services, the Royal Institute of Chartered Affairs and architects. Now, all of them have some direct involvement in fire safety, but none of these roles directly are on a fire risk assessor, which is its own niche specific role. So this is something that we need to consider because it can be very influential if someone is applying to be a fire risk assessor on the back of, for example, being there is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services. Now due to them having to be impartial because they enforce the legislation in Scotland, they're not allowed to write or conduct fire risk assessments. So none of them in their career will have conducted or written a fire risk assessment. They will have reviewed them if you work in the Fire Safety Enforcement Department. So again, none of these specifically qualify you as a competent fire risk assessor. None of the above. So the responsibility it lies with the duty holder for fire safety for your premises, and that involves who you procure as a fire risk assessor. Now, in a workplace, it could be anybody as an employer, it's involved in part of the premises, the owner or the occupier, and you have the responsibility under the Fire Scotland Act and the Fire Safety Regulations, all responsibilities lie with you. And that ultimately is on the procurement of a fire risk assessor. Now, you may delegate a nominated person in your organisation, either fire safety or health and safety, to conduct that role for you, but it's ultimately your responsibility to ensure you've taken the correct steps in due diligence to procure a fire risk assessor. So looking at this um, table, this is provided by Scottish Fire and Rescue Services. Um, it provides guidance on how to find a competent fire risk assessor. There are professional body registration schemes, and there are certificate schemes by UCAS, United Kingdom Accreditation Scheme. And it's also important that the company who the fire risk assessor works for has adequate management systems in place, even if the fire risk assessor is self-employed. If you look at the bottom, it says, as recommended, only fire risk assessment companies, including sole traders, which are third parties certificated to appropriate schemes operated by certification bodies, which have been UCAS accredited to certificate against such schemes are used. Now, I'll be honest, when I was looking at myself developing the fire risk as a risk assessor, I looked at all the different options. There's membership to professional bodies, but the United Kingdom Accounting Scheme is an independent government body. There's only one organisation in the UK, Warrington Certification, that has a flat scheme for individuals to become a UCAS accredited risk assessor. And that's a process I put myself through. To separate myself, obviously, from other fire risk assessors, there's some of them aren't, aren't registered or registered with professional bodies. It's an independent body that assesses you and involves myself going down to Warrington, being in a room for four hours with a doctor of fire science, University of Lancaster, and two invigilators to make sure that we weren't buddy buddies. Uh, no books, ask questions in all areas of fire risk assessments for four hours and to pass that uh, accreditation, which successfully I did. I was the first person in Scotland to do it in February 2018. Here are a table showing some of the bodies that will conduct uh, professional registered bodies and the UCAS accreditation schemes. 
as you'll see at the bottom, uh, the Warrington testing certification scheme are the only body that provides it for individuals. There are complex certification schemes and professional bodies registration schemes. So this is a source for yourself to look for. They'll have registers of risk assessors where the body will have assessed the risk assessments and the assessor are deemed as suitably competent for their standards and have won their register. And the issue of fire safety managers, slightly different because they have a tiered scheme where there's different labels. As we know, the number of people that pass a driving test, there's different standards of drivers on the road. So they have uh, three, three tiers, tiers one, two, and three. And as for introduction, intermediate, and competent fire risk assessors at complex premises. And again, I've managed to get myself on the tier three scheme with Institute of Fire Safety Managers. So some of the things you should be looking to undertake, ensure the scope of the work you want is carried out is agreed. You can do it formally in writing, so there's no ambiguity. Go to ensure the risk assessor gets access to all areas. So for example, if you're in a block of flats and there's no keys to the loft space, then you can inspect it. So you're, there's limitations on what the risk assessor can actually inspect. And there may be issues in there that's going to be unidentified. Make sure you get alternative quote, or quotes from other service providers. Ask for proof of insurances, professional indemnity, public liability, etc. And ensure you have actually taken advocate records of the steps you took to select your fire risk assessor. Now, know what the bottom is fire risk services, they can't recommend, they're going to be completely impartial, they'll not be involved in conducting or providing risk assessments. But you can speak to them for advice and they'll refer you to their website um, where these tables and charts we've looked at today will be provided. So other things you should want to specify the extent of the fire risk assessment required. And we'll touch on that a wee bit when we do the types of domestic risk assessments for blocks of flats. The style and the format required for the report, the national guidance document is past 79. But it's probably an updated version of 2020. That is a standard national accepted methodology for conducting fire risk assessments. Your actual plan should show priorities and time scales. It's indicative of how urgent, priority, and time scale that should be completed. And the report should differentiate between recommendations that are important to life safety and other ones that's of good practice. The conclusions of a risk assessment should be supported by reasoned judgment. So if you have a recommendation, personally, I'll type, like to type why it's an issue and the issue, why it's an issue and the recommendation for remedial actions to be provided. So it's quite clear in layman's terms what the issues are and how to resolve it and why it's an issue. So some of the following types of conclusion risk assessors should be challenged. Generic recommendations are not specific to the premises. Now, some of the things I commonly see are lightning protection recommendations for even single storey and two storey blocks that they should you know, get a, uh, a lightning protection. Where there's no life, electrical life safety systems involved in the building, it's two storey, it's surrounded by multitudes of larger, higher buildings, then it's really why we recommend them to get lightning protection. Attempt to transfer risk away from the, the assessor. And decisions that appear to be precautionary and be risk averse. So again, make a judgment. You're expecting your risk assessor to make a judgment. If you see a door and there's some kind of slight imperfection, are you going to recommend a full new fire door? Or can you recommend you no know, maintain this door, ensure further damage or whatever uh, doesn't affect the door's capacity to provide the correct resistance? It's these things you've got to consider and make a judgment. Well, if the door's warped, it's totally really badly damaged, then fine. Well, you are going to be looking at well, replacing the doors. But if there's slight imperfections there, um, then you really need to justify why we're going to be spending all this money on doors. C could remedial what's be conducted? Let's have a look at that before we start looking at recommendations just to simply replace them. So we're going to look at the types of fire assessment that have been designed for blocks of flats. Now, this is not typically seen in Scotland. They've been designed 
as part of the legislation document, fire safety purpose built blocks of flats and pass in 2020, which is written uh, by Colin Todd. And it gives you kind of guidance on the type of scope of works that could be conducted on blocks of flats. Now, because in England, under their legislation, blocks of flats do fall under their fire safety legislation, it's a bit of a grey area in Scotland. But certainly, um, if I speak to clients and asking about risk assessments in their flats, I will ask, typically, initially, as we'll find out as we touch on them, it's typically a type one, which is your, in England, that is your basic fundamental risk assessment that can be conducted. And that's just the common areas. And you've also got a type three, which would involve gas to go into the flat. So when we look at them, and as I say here, this is the guidance taken directly from Scotland's practical fire safety guidance for high rise domestic flats. Although it's not legislation, the wording here is guidance, strong recommendation for those organisations responsible for the management of high rise blocks, carry out an assessment of fire risk in the building as part of their corporate responsibility. Now, high rise blocks of flats are typically six storeys and over. So does that mean we know we don't have any concerns of four storey blocks, five storey blocks? It does leave a grey area because there's nothing clear in the guidance in Scotland. Moving on. This is the legislation that is prevalent to blocks of flats in Scotland. So the Flat Scotland Act typically um, doesn't apply to individual flats or the common areas, but there may be some parts of the, the high rise building. So you could have a concierge office station within the building. You could have commercial shops on the ground floor, etc. Now they would fall under Fire Scotland Act. Fire safety regulations. So again, there's provisions in here by where any fire safety provisions within blocks of flats, they must be maintained um, and be fit for purpose. For example, if there's dry risers, if there's automatic opening vents, if there's emergency escape lighting, dry risers, these all must be maintained and tested periodically. The Civic Government Act. Now, this is a legal duty, not just on uh, the duty holder, but occupants and residents. They maintain the common areas obstruction-free and combustible-free. Uh, obviously, there's the scope for malicious activity, but also the obstructions can impede on firefighters' activities within these blocks. So there is a legal duty in there to not have obstructions and stories of combustibles within common areas. Housing Acts, various acts within the Housing Acts, obviously part of legislation. Um, they must have a provision for detecting fires and giving warning of fires to all residents. Also, they must have a test inspection of electrical or relevant gas uh, installations within the houses. And as you see, <clears throat> the quality standard requires one smoke alarm in any social rented property and for thumb locks to allow escape in the event of fire. So you're not escaping without the, requiring the use of a key, which could be on them, you know, stored somewhere else, not directly in the door. And the tolerable act in Scotland is obviously as of February 22, is required that an LD2 um, non domestic fire alarm system is installed within all these uh, non-domestic premises, sorry, domestic premises. So, type one, very basic, inspection of the common areas, which the common areas, this is just internal, the common areas, it's also the external walls. So if there's cladding systems on external walls, we must consider the risk of fire spread on the external walls. If there's a considerable risk, Identify the materials as unknown the materials, then we should actually um, have a survey conducted. There's, there's a sample survey or a full past 1980, um, we come out in 2020. There's a survey of external walls, identify obviously the risk of fire spread um, on external walls. Have identified and ensure they are compliant. There's not going to be any rapid risk of fire spread on external walls. Examination of where possible, a uh, sample of fly entrance doors to ensure they're adequate. So again, high rise flats in Scotland, they're recommending self-closing fire doors of 60 minutes with smoke seals and intermittent strips, self-closing. 
and let lower premises, there should be 30 minute fire doors, self closing, intermittent strips, and smoke seals to protect the common areas, which is a means of escape. Um, also, you might be checking any demount easily demountable false ceilings, false tile ceilings, etc. Seven risers, electrical cupboards, where do you get access into? But as I said, at Disney, actually fair to go into the flats. A type two. Now, this would be some of the type one, except a, a degree of destructive inspection. Now, that's maybe be it's a secured locked service riser. You may be asked if you get concerns about any complementation. You may be asked to you know, get a contractor arranged to come back on the site and remove the risers and conduct your inspection until you're satisfied. If you have any concerns, there may be remedial works or you're happy with what you've seen. Type three. This does involve a type one, but it goes beyond the scope of it and it involves the housing acts. So it's a way of capturing the means for escape internally within the, the flats. The alarms installations are the compliant and the protection of the internal common layers uh, within the flat itself. So unless you can go in and actually see yourself and as a duty holder, it's a good way to get a full recorded risk assessment report on your uh, premises, not just common areas, but your flats as well. And you can also identify if there's any risk of any services breaching through the flats, from flat to flats, horizontally or vertically. And you may then have some concerns or you're satisfied. But that, either way, you're going to get a recorded uh, fire risk assessment report, common areas and within the flats themselves. Type four risk assessment, <clears throat> same as a type three, except degree of destructive inspection in both the common parts and the flats. Now, again, maybe open up samples of uh, construction to inspect the separation and complementation is adequate. That's just something I'd like to get any concerns identified through your type three risk assessment when the flats are common areas. You might recommend as a type four conducted to satisfy um, if you've got any concerns as you conduct your risk assessment. So these are the types of risk assessment on domestic flats for duty holders. I'm not typically seen in Scotland, but I want to familiarise myself with them in regards to the scope of work. I thought it would be helpful to some duty holders. So the next section topic we're going to be discussing, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services. What is changing? So from the 1st of July, they will stop attending automatic fire alarms, call outs to commercial businesses or workplaces such as factories, offices, and shops, unless a fire or sign of fire has been confirmed. Big exclusion would be all sleeping risk premises are exempt. So if you've got a sleeping risk premise and you can always look, you're not getting any concerns with a hotel, obviously, care homes, shelter accommodations, hostels, etc you will have automatic attendance to your premise or predetermined attendance by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services. What did the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services deem and accept as signs of fire? Though the dispatch, the predetermined attendance to your premises, whether it's two appliances or three appliances, depending on the size and nature of the premises, Fire, says a fire confirmed by a satisfactory, a satisfactory 999 call. And that's going to involve, if a smoke detector has been off, it's going to involve, and we'll touch on this a wee bit later, someday we'll have to conduct an inspection to confirm. You need to confirm as that's a sea fire, just signs of fire, heat, smoke, etc., would be sufficient. You can then set down 999 and pass it on there. We'll touch on procedures for that later. Fire alarm signal originated from two smoke detectors, not one. Two smoke detectors is called the coincidence effect. So if you have a room or a compartment with one detector going off and two detectors go within that compartment or one within it and a joining compartment, there's a more than a high probability there's an actual fire. So that's a satisfactory uh, signal fire. A single heat detector. A single manual call point and a single multi sensor detector, which picks up obviously smoke, heat, and gases. So, again, 
of all three signs of fire are there, that's a pretty strong indicator. You have uh, signs of fire within the premise. And finally, an automatic sprinkler system that has been interfaced with the fire alarm panel. And that would send a signal through to if you had an alarm system, so the alarm receiving center, it should be identified that that is also an acceptable uh, sign of fire. Why the change? So, 21 22, there was 51,734 false alarms, considerably higher than last year's 46,000. So, you can imagine the drain on the resources of the Scottish Fire Medical Service to attend all these false alarms and the probability or the likelihood that this impact their attendance to actual emergencies. So, there really is uh, a big, significant uh, time and resource uh, impact there. So, fire false alarm incidents for detecting apparatus as raising alarm is the main cause of this increase. In 2021-22, there were 40,509 of these incidents up from 35,812, so a 13% increase. So, the trend is going upwards. So, the last is looked to address it. Why Scotland? As you can see, per million, in the country, we've got 9,441 uh, false alarms, which is significantly higher on Wales, 4,930. So that's why Scotland obtained some action on this. Um, and you can see that is uh, really significant. And we've got a lot of rural areas in Scotland where if an appliance has to turn to false alarms as an instant, you know, it could be a rural area that's really need some support. Mm. And that could be a big, big delay. So. The indicators are there. We need to put improved management systems in place in Scotland. And this is why Scottish Fire Medical Services have looked to implement this uh, change in procedures. So, some guidance for the prevention of unwanted fire alarm signals. Identifying as a known history of unwanted fire alarm signals at your premises. And if you've got suitable new relaxes put in place, so this is something I would advise. If you're not already doing it, if you're having false alarms, get them recorded, find out the root cause, and look to put a suitable control measure in place. Whether it's a procedural toolbox talks to your staff, uh, whether it's system changes, um, amendments to your fire alarm system, whatever it's going to take, you want to obviously minimise unwanted fire alarm signals. Ensure automatic fire detectors are installed and maintained. DPS 5839 Part 1, 2017. Check you have the correct detector types and their locations. Consider with moving detectors, changing the type and reducing activations. If you have any concerns, for example, uh, recently I was at a job where there's heat detectors, typically they're in a the kitchen, but just the position of the ovens the oven doors have been on, steam has been released, and also the temperature is triggering the heat detectors. Smoke detectors being near areas where there's dust, steam, gases, etc., moisture, the detector can be going off and causing false alarms. So have a review of your systems and get some consultation with your fire alarm uh, preferred engineer. Another point that we'll I'll overlook there. You get false alarms and manual call points maliciously. So as a preventative measure, PS5839 Part 1 does recommend the provided with protective covers as a means of mitigating. It's not going to eliminate it. If you want to pick up and hit the call point, you can still do that, but it is something that's a preventative measure. And again, it's sharing best practices with all your relevant persons, staff, contractors, anybody within your premises. Uh, avoid cooking, as I mentioned, releases really smoke and steam, aerosols near smoke detectors, the fire alarm system taking off while you're testing it, make sure they're offline as well, if you get, are covered with uh, contractors are operating it. So just a wee that thinking ahead and preventative and protective measures to ensure you can minimise the uh, unwanted fire alarm signals. So some guidance for your fire alarm systems. 
So if you have a conventional system, consider upgrading to a file lamp panel. Um, otherwise known as a control and indicating equipment uh, to an addressable system, as it can distinguish the source of alarms and it also quickly tells you identify the location, the zone, and the room of where uh, the source of the, the, the alarms are originating. So, as we touched on, addressable fire alarm panel, detail the zone and room location of the fire alarm actuation. This will enable an efficient investigation and avoid delays. So if you've got your staff as part of your emergency procedures, normally the persons go to the, the alarm panel, will identify the location of the actuation, and obviously you have then have normally the persons who can go and quickly investigate. And it actually should tell, tell you also um, the detector that's uh, it's coming from. So another thing to consider here, the fire alarm engineer, it's not something they would typically do, but they have the capacity. So it's something to consider as well. The fire alarm engineer to ensure the text that comes up on your fire alarm panel. It details the source of the fire, telling you clearly that it's coming from a manual call point, smoke, heat detector, sprinkler. So again, you know straight away um, at that fire alarm panel, an actuation very quickly, the source of the alarm. And another thing, obviously, as I said, if any one smoke detector going off, the Scottish Fire Medical Service are not going to attend automatically. So, fire alarm engineer should also configure the addressable panel, identify when two or more smoke detectors are actuated, which, as I've stated, is a coincidence effect. Because the coincidence of two detectors are off is a Strong indicator there is a fire. So they should have also configured your system to identify that. And that way, again, it's avoiding any unnecessary delays and Scottish Fire and Rescue Services attending your premises. This is what these kind of recommendations or guidance are. Whether they're relevant to premises or not, I don't know, but it's something for you to consider. So, guidance if you do have a, an alarm receiving centre, also known as your ARC. Ensure, again, for the purpose of avoiding any delays in the fire service, turn up to your premises. Also, make sure life safety and obviously your business, your property and business protection uh, has got a, an attendance without any delays. Ensure they have your correct details. And that would also be clarify them if it was a sleeping premise. Sleep this premise, let them know, ensure that's uh, part of their details for your premise, and make sure all your other details is up to date. So your address, make sure that a correct address with a postcode, no ambiguity, because there is some addresses that can be very vague. And um, when I worked in fire service, and you're putting a, a, an attendance, and it was very vague. We're driving about looking for these addresses with nothing specific. It's maybe the name of a house. So ensure they've got as accurate details as you can for your premise type and your addressable location. Again, going back to what I said about the fire alarm system, establish if the fire alarm signal coming from your alarm panel being sent to your alarm receiving centre can determine the originating source of the alarm signal that is coming through from a manual call point, heat detector, smoke detector, sprinklers, etc. And that is, as we said earlier, an acceptable sign of fire from your premise and they will automatically dispatch the correct predetermined attendance. So, even if your alarm system is linked to an alarm receiving centre, it should be ensured that formally nominated and trained staff as part of your emergency fire action plan, they're familiar with your UFAS policy to safely investigate and confirm if there is a fire or signs of fire, both in and out of normal business hours. That's something for you to consider. So if you have a premises that's unoccupied or business hours, you're going to have to have, looking at have a key holder to come and conduct a invest, safe investigation for signs of fire. Bear in mind, you don't need to go in and like fuel flames or it's just signs of fire, heat, smoke. Again, the fire lamp panels there, it should hopefully help to tell you the area, the zone, the room it's located, so you can safely travel through, typically protected corridors, 
stairs, etc., to just check. And even if it's you go up to a room or an area, sorry, if you enter a room in an area through a door, just check your hands at the back of the door. Same kind of training we got in the fire service, just feel that door for heat. If you feel obviously heat on the back of your hand in that door, it's a good indicator there's a, a fire or another side of that door. So these are all kind of safe procedures um, that will have to be implemented if you are investigating for signs of fire out of hours and inside hours. So you would have to conduct this before dial 999 because if you dial 999 and you're still not conducting an investigation, you're just wasting time because they're not going to dispatch automatically if it comes from one detector without variable confirmation as well, you have identified signs of fire. So again, conduct an investigation. If there's one smoke detector, you need to do an investigation. These are variable satisfactory response by 999. Pass on over information, full address, postal code, details of the premise, and the nature and location of the fire. And um, anything else that's relevant, if there's hazards, etc. Uh, if it's a large site you have, what would be the best entrance, most appropriate entrance to come in from, or anything that's relevant, pass it on to the fire service so they can do their soft, uh, job as effectively and sufficiently as possible. So, something that's very common in larger complex premises and even like sleeping risks, like hotels, they will implement a delay for investigation by where staff will get an alert of the fire alarm signal initially to conduct investigations at a set period of time before the local system, fire alarm system, will go to full alert and a scene and evacuation. Typically, it can be up to three minutes. It can be, depending on the size of your premises, the British standard can rise up to 10 minutes. But again, you'll know your premises, identify how long you assess it would take any staff to conduct an investigation. So let's have a look at this uh, procedure. Procedure provides a period of time after the initial alarm activation for normal to start to investigate prior to the system going to full alarm, which would also initiate the evacuation from the premises. Again, that still might not initiate attendance for the fire service because we need to confirm, if it came from one smoke detector, we need to confirm um, we have identified signs of fire for them to attend. To help your nominated persons get an alert, have a clear zone plan directly beside the fire alarm panel, unambiguous, because I've seen some fire zone plans and they're faded, they're grey, they're unclear. If you turn up to them at two in the morning and you're looking at it and trying to uh, work out the areas within this uh, building, they're now unimpossible. So just make them crystal clear, at its guide, unambiguous, and right beside the fire alarm panel, but it also supports your staff who should be familiar with the premise on the location of the room or area fire zone that uh, has been actuated. Develop safe procedures for safety investigation. So, for example, typically there's no safe procedures. Every place will be different, but typically you would have one person going to the fire alarm panel. The appropriate communications, because we're in the fire service and we had handheld radios, they were BA sets and they were really bad. You would lose communications in multi-story buildings, and obviously that can't happen when you're trying to go and investigate. You want clear communications from the guys. When they go and investigate, two people going together to conduct an investigation. One says alarm panel. If they, they identify signs of fire, they can initiate a full alert by hitting the manual call point straight away or communicating back to, obviously, the person in the alarm panel to dial 999 and identify, confirm there are signs of fire identified. So these procedures should be developed. As I said, we need to provide procedures in place. We need to follow up with advocate training to the nominated staff who should be familiar to interpret the fire alarm panel, understand all the fire zone plans, the location of them, being aware of any hazards in the work area, and also being aware of potential fire behaviour and spread. So again, this is obviously issues, being aware of it. Avoid the original open fire doors. You want to spread into obviously escape routes. These are all things 
that the best practices are put in place, but for your staff conduct these investigations, we need to provide them adequate training and formalisation of all the processes and procedures and the areas. And last but not least, there must be super communications, whether it's uh, phones, ensuring we've got signals that can go through the, the, the workplace you're building. So just a wee summary from the guidance we have talked about, to have suitable preventative measures in place to mitigate the risk, identifying causes, any previous history, collect smoke detectors, do we upgrade them to multi-sensor detectors, do we upgrade the um, fire alarm panel, are they maintained, are they installed correctly? Again, have you got appropriate coverage of the fire alarm system? And again, mention off the, the fire alarm panel. If you want some unnecessary, avoid unnecessary delays, we're going to be looking at an addressable panel, which can identify the source of the fire alarm signal and ensure that signal also carries through to alarm receiving centre. Ensure they've got your correct details. If you're a sleeping risk, let them know. Whatever type of premise you have, a warehouse, factory, shop, office, library, let them know. It's all relevant for the fire service and they can pass through the information about your premises. It may be an appliance coming from out with your area. They're not familiar with the building or your area. Again, this is a must. Uh, you must update your emergency fire action plan procedures to reflect these pending changes. We come in the 1st of July, we've been aware of it for now um, for a number of months. So we must have this uh, put in place and the shared role relevant persons, which means the nominated persons, contractors, staff, management, whoever else it may be, other occupiers when you're building, must be shared. So we're all signing off the same page and everybody's aware of it. And have all nominated staff been provided with adequate training and the resources, as in communication systems, etc to implement the emergency fire action plan for your premise. Last but not least, well, lastly, some of the national bodies have provided some guidance. And if Julie could possibly maybe share this, um, these links, there is guidance here on eliminating unwanted fire alarm actuations provided by the Fire Industry Association and the National Fire Chiefs Council. And guidance on investigating fire alarm actuations by the Fire Industry Association. So there's some guidance here, but you can take the guidance and make it bespoke to your premises because you will know your premises better than anybody. The layout, complex, and the arrangements within it. So hopefully all these help. Um, appreciate your time. Or hopefully some of the content we've covered there. Uh, has been a benefit. If there are any questions, Julie? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, I can share the link. Somebody has asked if they can have a copy of your presentation. Would you feel comfortable doing that? Would you prefer well, me to email the links? Not a problem. Not a problem. Okay. Take, a, take a note, I'll, I'll can put forward that onto you. Whoever's uh, requesting them. Yeah, not any questions yet. Does anybody have a question for Ian today? It's a really, I'm, I'm amazed how much information you've packed into 45 minutes, if I'm honest. Um, but if you have any questions, now's the time. Um, Ian, are there, whilst people are thinking about their questions and typing them out, are there any um, closing thoughts for today's presentation or top tips that they can take away? Um, Don't I'm worry really, if not, because I think no, you've covered... I, I think you really see, you know, you should be very familiar where there's maybe a shortfall. The key thing is you wish to, for your premise, your building, workplace, whatever it may be, to avoid any unnecessary delays of attending the fire service. Again, protect life and for you as a, maybe a business owner, protect your property and protect your uh, business continuity. So to avoid that, some of the considerations are proposed should steered you in the kind of correct areas of where um, to find a solution 
to minimise that. Again, three point locally, for the correct preventive and protective measures in place, sharing best practices, ensuring obviously um, any false alarms identified and eliminate it ideally. I think British standard, it's, I think there's a guidance that says a premise up to with 75 detectors on average, what is tolerable would be one false alarm per year with 75 detectors. Um, so that gives you an indicator. It's not a raw, it's just a raw thumb, but just a, a way of, of thinking about it. But um, I, I, no, I think probably the, the guys are pretty in there's, I think, kind of comprehensive. We need to get the correct systems in place to minimise that, correct procedures in place to manage delays and the correct training in place. So the, the relevant people are familiar with what's required of them and day trial runs, day dry runs of your building. The, the, for example, the and the delay to investigate, I would just say, do a dry run on your premises. So if you've maybe got security staff, minimal one, two security staff overnight, um, how long would it take them to identify the first away area in your building and raise the alarm? So that's great. Like that. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions in now, and um, we're getting quite a few questions. And um, let's see if we, how many we can answer. So the first one is, is the risk assessor selected by a private body or a governmental body? I'm not sure if this is um, one of our international members um, or a UK member, I'm not sure. So I'm not yep. sure if the answer will be different. Sorry, I, I, I didn't get the question, I'm really sorry. Oh, sorry. It says, is the risk assessor selected by a private body or governmental body? No, that doesn't deflate the responsibility. If you're in the UK, obviously in Scotland, um, you're the duty holder, you're ultimately responsible. You can have somebody else selecting your uh, competent fire risk assessor. Uh, you need to put your own measures in place to procure them yourself. You can't have somebody else do it for you. Internally, you could have a nominated person yep. as your fire safety manager to get through the process. So there wouldn't be any other bodies or okay. even, with, even with a government body. It, yeah, it so if, if people are based in another country, then you, you can't really answer that yeah, question, I, can I, you? Yeah, that would be a different kind of um, Yeah, okay, thank that. you. So we've now got another question. Um, Ian, can you provide any guidance for factored properties where residents are using service cupboards and risers to store household goods and materials? And then it says, can SFRS assist using Civic Governmental yeah. Act? Yeah, uh, it's common. It's common. I've been common to these in cupboards, there's bikes, there's uh, cuddly toys, there's you name it, bed mattresses um, in these areas. So if they're in the, the service cupboards, <clears throat> how they can access, if we get, you know, is it secured restricted access keys? So we need to also look at that, restricting access. Service cupboards really should only be accessed by the contractors for maintenance purposes. Um, common areas, yeah, certainly engage if it's really significant, some a problem that you've actually engaged with the residents and they're still not adhering to obviously uh, your recommendation for compliance, then engage the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services and they can actually conduct a home fire safety visit and speak to them. So that's what I would recommend. Restrict access to service uh, covers and risers, have them locked, restrict access and um, engage with them on the reasons why and if they're ignoring you, then engage with the fire service and they should then conduct it. And the fire safety enforcement have uh, the legal powers to take uh, actions on that. Great, thank you. We've got so many questions. So let's see how many um, we've got time to answer today. Um, so this, um, this attendee says, I understand that the multinational org adopting NFPA, is there a link on the standards to UK fire safety regulations? I'm not sure if... I've read that correctly, but does that makes sense to you. Yeah, I think NFPA that is an international um, code of practice for fire safety. Um, in Scotland, obviously, it's the fire Scotland Act and the regulations, and there's approved codes of practice. Um, there's public available schemes, PAS, um, that they're all available. So if you go to the, the, the Scottish government website, the Scottish Fire Rescue website, um, they should provide links. They will provide links. To all the relevant legislation, sorry, and both Scotland and UK wide. 
Great, the, thank the you. Of is it's an international uh, fire safety uh, code of practice. OK, so I think this one's more of an opinion. So with England's new Regulation 10 guidelines recently introduced, when do you think Scotland will confirm and issue their updates of the same matters? Sorry, what was that England that introducing what, sorry? England's new Regulation 10 guidelines have recently been introduced. When do you think Scotland will confirm and issue their updates of the same matters? Right, I need to be specific on what regulation they're referring to. I know regulation, I know, regulation ten. And what I'm not, I don't really. I specialise in Scotland, um, so unless I know what that is, and uh, okay. share that with me, I can give some feedback. Okay. And I know England is really followed on which Scotland regulations are. So, okay. The first Scotland Act is prescriptive, not descriptive, and the regulations do get in a lot more detail on what the, the the legal duties are. So, regulation ten. My apologies. Um, I'm not being, uh, biased, yeah. but it's, it's, that's it's, completely it's, understandable. So, yeah. um, Steve, if you can clarify what regulation ten yeah, is, please do. Um, Ian might be able to answer it. So, the next one is: following your guidance, can you confirm progressive horizontal and in brackets and vertical remains legal in care homes from July 2023, as opposed to automatic evacuation of all residents following alarm activation? Care homes, well, there's, there's nothing impacts care homes at all. Nothing impacts. So the progressive, horizontal, vertical, to move away out of the zone or area uh, where there is an actuation, that will just proceed as normal and you will automatically get an attendance. Care homes must have an alarm receiving centre. That's a legal duty in Scotland following the Rose Park incident, I believe, 2004. Um, the, it's a premise that must have an, an alarm receiving centre. So there's nothing changes. Uh, with care homes. Okay, thank you. I think there's a word missing in this next question, but hopefully you can um, figure out the context. Insurance companies are requiring five fire risk assessors like yourself to their customers. Oh, insurance companies are are requiring fire and risk assessors like yourself to their company to their customers. Have you seen this in your own customers asking for your support? on the back of that recommendation or from their own decision-making process? From insurance companies? Um, yeah. not, really, not really insurance companies, but you know, indirectly, because as part of compliance, um, persons selling premises or buying premises, part of that process involves compliance, fire safety, Legionella as based on, et cetera. So that is where there is a requirement for it. So that is probably the indirect where I've been involved uh, in providing fast safety compliance, but not directly through an insurance uh, provider. Again, they might specify somebody must be, I would imagine they would specify somebody must be a, at least at least registered with a professional body or again, UCAS accredited, which is an independent third party accreditation. Great, thank you. And Steve's come back to clarify what Regulation 10 is. So Regulation 10 is for the domestic common area entrance doors being inspected every quarter rather than once a year, fully digitalised and fully access report from all duty holders. Uh, uh, well, so it, I, I, think, I think the original question was it's been brought into effect in England. Do you think yeah, it's likely yeah. to come in in Scotland? I, I really wish it would be. Then it'd be crystal clear and say that there's too many. For me, domestic premises in Scotland, but the way the legislation is coming just now, it's a grey area. And there are duty holders where I don't need to do that. <clears throat> but if it's crystal clear and definitive, no, uh, it's, we strongly recommend make it legislation and agree fire those can check periodically. Um, front flying is those that are going to be used daily, multiple times. Um, Top floors and high rise flats, the doors won't get used much, but the ground floor yeah. uh, fire doors, they're going to be used many times. So there is a, re a requirement to have these doors checked periodically to make sure they're fit for purpose and provide the, the correct level of protection to the, the escapes, uh, means of escape. So I right. hope they do. I don't know if they, if they will, because this has been for years. Uh, so Sorry, I didn't know this English one, Steve. Sorry. That's OK. You're not, you're not meant to know everything. So we've got the last question now from Elizabeth. So PAS 79-2 was withdrawn by BSI in March 2021. The steering group have agreed a full revision should be undertaken as a British standard. The PAS has been withdrawn whilst the British standard is in development. Do we know when this will be issued? 
they don't. And I think part of the reason was that behind that would be um, Grenfell. And part of it because there wasn't any at the time. I think it's changed. My apologies, I'm not fully up to speed on the change in the English legislation, but there is now a requirement for where it's known, persons can't um, respond or self-evacuate, that there's a PEEP provided for them. So that was one of the key parts because this didn't form part of the original uh, past 79 that came out. So I believe that was a key part of it and that's why it was withdrawn because of that. So again, my apologies, I don't know, but I think that was one of the key parts uh, of why it was withdrawn. Thank you anyway. You, you you can't you know legislation in all countries. So thank you for that. Thank you so much today for a fantastic presentation. We've had a number of comments saying thank you, really interesting webinar, learnt a lot. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I think the consensus is it's been a, a really good webinar today. So thank you very much for giving up your valuable time, Ian. And well, thank to you. And to it, Scotland it, branch. Thank you, Julie. And if this is something that has been tested duty holders in Scotland then it's something we can look to sell periodically. And again, you can even select the topics and we'll have a discussion about it. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for attending, everyone. If anyone wants an attendance certificate, that will come out this time tomorrow. Um, I don't work on Friday, so I'll upload the recording to the YouTube channel on Monday and I'll send out the um, a copy of the presentation to those who want it. I've noted one member wants it, Michael. If anybody wants a copy of the presentations, please email me at branches at rsm.org and I'll send you a copy next week. So thank you again, Ian, for a great webinar. Really appreciate it and like to wish everyone a good afternoon or a good evening wherever you are in the world. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.